I'm recording to the clap. Well, yeah, because guess what? Women, should I? Maybe we well, should introduce. No, you know what we're going to do? We've got so many curveballs for you today, but guess what? Here's your greatest curveball ever. <laughs> uh, Our Feedback Friday singer is here who wrote the Feedback, the Feedback Friday, Friday song. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Snyder performing live the Feedback Friday song. Look at Suzanne already. Yeah, she's ready. She's ready. This is my biggest hit. This is Jimmy's <laughs> biggest hit. All right, everybody mute themselves. Are we ready? I think so. Are you ready? I think so. All right. All right. Great. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where well, you been? Well, now, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We've got a presenter that you never seen. It's Feedback Friday and we're all on the loose. You be the train, we'll be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Amy and Breeze. They're like the axle and the grease. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, feedback, feedback Friday. One of my strings went out of tune. Hey, yeah. <laughs> All right, look at all the, look at that. Look at Yay. all these people. 200 people, Jimmy. This is like the biggest gig. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. All right. All right, great. Thanks, Brees. Thanks for muting me. <laughs> yeah, I was tired of hearing uh, you talking. Okay. Yeah. And, and Liz, how are you doing? Just I'm great. Okay, I'm, I'm well. Good. I'm ready. All right, well, hold on. We'll do the intro first, which is, I write this for Kathy every week, so I don't really need it, but good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to episode 56, 56 weeks of Feedback Fridays with the coolest people ever. Yep, 56, thanks, Brees. So this is our show, we, and we do call it a show now because we now have live music uh, where we speak with dyers, artists, scientists, writers, scholars, crazy people about natural dyes and all things color and where it comes from. I am Amy Dufo. I always say Dufault, but I never tell Kathy. Um, I am Amy Dufo, and I am the Sustainability and Communications Director for Botanical Colors, and I run social media too, so I see everybody all the time in my magic mirror. And I'm here with Brees Honeycutt, who is my best friend in the world. And she's a textile artist and natural dyer and one of the nicest human beings ever created. Uh, today we have Liz Spencer, also known as the Dogwood Dyer, who has, is probably has her heart beating out of her chest from being stuck in traffic <laughs> on the highway with an overturned vehicle. And we haven't been in practice to see if her presentation works. So, Again, lots of curveballs today, but um, yep. And so Liz will be talking about all the natural dye work that she does. And she's a prolific natural dyer who has three kids. And if you follow her on Instagram, you're always like, how does she do that? And have three kids who are all wearing natural dye clothing. What is happening there? Uh, now for a little housekeeping. So usually I'm, I'm running the chat. I'm going to continue to run the chat. We have you all muted right now. We'll un and uh, after Liz's presentation, we are going to turn the chat back on so you can ask her questions. And I'll ask questions. And then we'll have picture of the week. So Adriana, I know you're here, but don't worry about unmuting yet because we were going to go with Adriana and picture of the week first. But we'll do that last. Uh, oh, thanks, Brice. She was trying to do the reverb. <laughs> all right. So without any further ado, as Kathy always says, Liz, <laughs> or did I, did I forget something? No. No, no. I'm good. All right, Liz, let's, let's see what you got. Thank you, Amy. Um, <laughs> and thank you for your patience. And, um, and yeah, I mean, what else could happen but um, a massive tra traffic jam <laughs> on the morning of Feedback Friday. Um, and I got here just in time and thank you all for being here. This is really, uh, really, really special um, 
and incredible that you're all taking the time to listen to me ramble on about dyeing my kids clothes. <laughs> but I promise there'll be more than that. Um, and also I'm in, I'm tuning in from my uh, nursery slash office slash sewing room. Um, and there's no lock on the door. So you might see a four-year-old ramble in, or join us. <laughs> Um, but that is the, that's really sort of the theme of my presentation, in fact, uh, is, is natural dyes while also caretaking full time. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, host disabled participant screen sharing. All right, here we go. Let's try that again. It's still saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm. Let's double check what's going on with Liz because we're here to troubleshoot. <clears throat> Liz. <laughs> here we are. How's that? All right. Can y'all see? We sure can. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, so, um, <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Uh, this is, I'd like to start my presentation um, just to talk about my, I think the reality of my practice as a, a full-time mother of three young kids. Um, and the reason why I chose this slide as my first image, um, just because you know my journey and my relationship with natural dyes um, has been a fine balance. <laughs> of our artistic discovery uh, alongside primary caretaking for kids. Um, and then tending to, you know, two small ones um, who are also forming their identity um, is, you know, not unlike tending a garden. <laughs> I found a lot of similarities um, growing dye plants over the years to growing children, um, many of which I'll share, um, you know, they both require an immense amount of patience, um, an openness and a willingness to learn not only about the subject and you know what it is that you are, um, what it is that you are um, pursuing to learn about, which is in this case um, plants as well as human beings, <laughs> um, but um, that. I learned a lot about myself growing both dye plants and, and raising kids. Um, you know, and I'm still in the thick of it. My kids are age um, seven, four, and 10 months. And this is just a picture of me picking flowers in the dye garden um, with my middle child, uh, May, who's now four, um, with me, who she often was um, right on my back. <laughs> I've even taught workshops. Um, <clears throat> in educational institutions with my child dropped to my back. So it's definitely possible. <laughs> Anyone who, who has primary care, care, who has been a primary caretaker for um, a small person um, can understand. So next slide. Wait, it's not letting me advance. Oh, here you go. Okay. So um, I started my my business or more so my identity um, I, concurrently with my business, which is the Dogwood Dyer um, in 2013, uh, when I moved back to the United States from London after I had finished a master's degree in sustainability and fashion at the London College of Fashion. And I wanted to, you know, name myself and kind of remove my name from my, my identity as a dyer uh, and a maker um, and use something like the dogwood dyer, um, mostly because of my sentimental relationship with the dogwood, the, the tree. Um, I have fond memories growing up in the Carolinas. I spent formative years um, in North and South Carolina and the blooming of the dogwood, to me, at least in, in memory of as a child, was the beginning of spring and um, sort of the awakening of of the plant world for me as a kid. And so uh, that's the really the story, the simple story behind the Dogwood Dyer, the, the reason why I chose to call, choose to call myself that. And ironically, of course, I live now in Southern California where there are no dogwoods to be found, but, um, but the name sticks. And uh, I started my business um, with the intention actually 
to start a dye house and um, to meet the needs of small and hopefully um, moving on into the growth of my business, medium to large scale businesses to meet their natural dye needs. And um, because I really immediately saw the further I got into my practice of natural dyeing, how much of a gap there is and how little availability there is for designers and home goods designers, text anyone working with textiles that wants to apply natural dyes. Um, and I had, you know, I had started with mostly friends who had, who had small businesses, sustainable fashion businesses that really understood um, the value of natural dyes, but understood as well that there's a seriously long learning curve um, and that it's not something um, that you just jump into and can master immediately. It's definitely a skill that is a, for a lifelong mastery. Uh, but I'm going to jump back to 2011 when I went to London. Um, I went to London specifically to seek out uh, the lecturers and the professors uh, that were teaching at my school because of their world-renowned um, uh, research and understanding of sustainable fashion and really pioneers in, in the sustainable fashion movement. But I definitely did not expect to be um, doing what I did there and something that actually changed my world and my life. Um, and I think the first month while I was studying, the uh, course director approached our group and, and said, you know, um, where I was in, at the London College of Fashion, there were five different uh, course campus sites and we were on Mare Street in Hackney and in East London. And the uh, site there was an old, um, an old shoe factory. It was actually called Cordwainers. Um, and there was already a local garden, uh, a local community garden who had been um, growing edibles on the site. And they approached the school and, and propositioned a potential collaboration between a student perhaps that wants to wanted to run a project of of creating a dye garden and I heard that immediately my ears perked up and I didn't know what that was but it sounded incredible and I definitely be, wanted to be part of it and so I spearheaded the project um, at, and with the help of um, many students and volunteer days, um, we raised enough money and had an, enough community effort to, uh, to put three raised beds or in-ground beds there. Um, and then I learned a lot. I mean, I always kind of say that I had a backwards entrance into the natural dye world because I had no natural dye experience whatsoever when I started this project. So it was a lot to learn at once. Um, and so really I've been gardening dye plants longer than I have been using them. <clears throat> and so you can see here the, the space before we put the bed in and you know, the space was really not being used by the, by the college. Um, it was more so a nuisance to the college uh, because they had to mow the grass and pick up the litter. And, um, and so we really transformed it just over a course of 15 months where, um, which was the amount of time that I was there studying. That's my friend Emily, who helped a lot with the with the garden as well, while, particularly while I was gone during some of the summer months in our first growing season. Um, and also that year of two, the following year, 2012, I um, I was doing some research to try and figure out what I wanted to do potential internships during my program uh, for natural dye specific. Um, and as you can imagine, there at that time there weren't many opportunities for natural dye specific learning or many natural dye specific learning opportunities. But then I found one um, at a place called the Textile Arts Center in Brooklyn. And they were, it, they were starting their first season of growing plants for dye and had on loan a space in, um, on Bergen Street in Brooklyn. And we uh, did everything from fundraising did fundraising to, um, to finding fellows that were interested in um, financially supporting at the get at the very beginning of the project. Um, so, um, and believed in the project. And then throughout that summer um, received natural dye stuffs, um, all different types of artists, not just textile artists, um, so that they could use locally grown uh, plants for dye. And then we also taught workshops in the garden for free for the public and also for the for the people that were receiving the dye stuffs. 
And so the format for the project was a, as a CSA. And if you're not familiar, a CSA is a, an acronym for community supported agriculture. So the model is oftentimes understood, of course, for farm shares. Um, you know, you have a direct relationship with the grower and you, the middleman is cut out. You know all of your, you're supporting them fully as much as you can. Um, you can have an intimate relationship with them um, and get to know many different plants and that perhaps you haven't had been exposed to. And that was the model that we were following for this dye garden. And we quickly found out too that growing quantity or growing, growing for yield in a city environment or in an urban environment was very hard. <laughs> As you can imagine, you need a lot more space to grow lots, a lot more dye plants. So um, over the years, that project um, and that program, it was called Sowing Seeds, um, changed, evolved into more of an educational garden program, which is still really incredible um, to be able to provide um, the knowledge and to see the transformation from plant to color um, in the city. And this is so, you know, I after moving back to the United to the States, um, finishing my degree in London and coming um, coming back to to be back in the States full time, I um, we kind of jumped around my partner and I in we lived in various different places in Manhattan and I didn't have a garden space. Uh, I checked all my local community gardens and all the gardens had wait lists for bed space and um, I was sort of, you know, itching to get, get, get my fingers in dirt and, and garden again. And so I, and I had already <laughs> I had already started many dye plants, um, seedlings, you know, young plants, and were just, they were kind of struggling in my front window, my sunniest window, and not thriving at all, and it was getting time to, to where I had to figure out what to do with them, and my partner um, had the genius idea, Sam, who is a, who has many years landscaping experience, said, we should just put these in the tree pits, you know, no one's using them in our, um, we lived in Brooklyn at the time, in our neighborhood, and, um, you know, depending on the block in the city, you'll see um, many people co-opting the space and using it, but at least in our, in our area, there wasn't. And so um, the city had also finished a really incredible initiative called the Million Trees Initiative, where they had planted a million trees throughout the five boroughs. And many of those young trees, you can't really see from this image, but this was a young tree that they had just transplanted uh, the year prior. Um, we're not thriving, at least in our area, you know, the soil was compacted, um, there was constantly litter, um, you know, trees would be abused. And so we figured that if I could, if we could protect those, those spaces in our immediate black environment, I could have a place to put my dye plants. I wouldn't have to worry really about soil testing or, um, you know, contaminants because they're dye plants and they're not to be ingested. And um, it was, we, we paid out of pocket just for the, the lumber, um, had a couple of community days where we had people, our neighbors helping us and, you know, we had a barbecue and fed everybody, but um, all in all, I think it, it was a win-win for, for the block because as you can see in mid-season, um, the, the area is much greener there. I saw a significant increase in pollinating insects and birds and, um, and so it really was um, a, a a heart project for me and a big learning experience as well about uh, gardening in a public space. It's not, it's not all rainbows, <laughs> but um, like for instance, this hollyhock plant here with the really broad leaves, anybody that's grown hollyhock might know, may know that it's a biennial. And so you wait two years to get your flowers that you're growing the plant for. And um, in this case, this particular tree guard was um, actually cut down. All the plants were cut down because the, um, gentleman who did the um, the maintenance in the building across the street thought there were all weeds and just cut them all down. <laughs> and so of course I was that crazy lady out there crying about her plants being cut down. <laughs> but um, that just uh, just furthered the project and 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 uh, or details that that came where you know signage to educate um, people about what the plants were and why they were there and and what they could do and not that they were mine but that they they're there for, for anyone to learn and to use if they liked, but please don't cut them down fully. Um, and we called it the Brooklyn Tree Garden. Um, we made we designed the bench top um, so that people could use, could sit down. It's a multi-purpose thing. It's not just protecting the plants. Um, for instance, the um, 
the man who owned the bodega down below our apartment could sit down on the bench top instead of pulling out the milk crate that he usually did. And so um, it was really uh, a, a nice intervention for growing in, a, in an urban space. <clears throat> And then also while in New York, I started uh, teaching at a couple of educational institutions. I taught students at FIT as well as at Parsons and yes. in a sustainable fashion and natural dyes. Um, and I had the privilege of um, mentoring and um, helping with a project to start a dye garden on the rooftop of uh, Fashion Institute of Technology um, in between 7th and 8th. Um, on 27th Street. And so that's a, a collaboration between Brooklyn Grange as well. They put the beds in and then we, I helped the students figure out what sorts of seeds they wanted to buy and from where and how they might wanna, um, you know, what plants to consider to, to grow there. Um, that's Meg and Caitlin and then Amber was also a, um, an integral part to that three student um, run program. Um, project and it's still there and this was the first growing season um, and you can see they're even doing some solar dye experiments there with the jars in the in the um, midsummer uh, the projects expanded and there have been other projects that complement the the dye garden on the fit rooftop such as a um, composting project where students have um, got funding for a rapid composter that was using uh, cotton muslin waste from fashion student uh, pattern cutting and, and garment making, which you could imagine there's quite a bit of at FIT or any fashion school, um, and composting that to make compost for the dye garden. Uh, and as well as um, bees, they, they, there's, a, there's also a beehive on the roof as well. Um, and so, I stayed in New York for four years and then moved to Southern California where I am now. And the, I, I showed this slide just to show that, you know, I quickly started my family and um, growing dye plants with my kids has been, um, I've learned so much. Uh, that's my son Dalton on the right there and his indigo dyed overalls and my daughter May there. Um, and that's actually a picture in, a, in upstate New York at an indigo farm. And, uh, you know, having her with me constantly um, and really walking that tightrope um, or that fine balance of mothering while teaching and being a creative full time, uh, which, you know, I hear that cliche question of, oh, how do you do it? How do you balance? And, um, and then oftentimes, when I try and think of a, a, an answer that people might want to hear, I feel bogus <laughs> because it is, it does feel bogus. And it is, it is um, a balance in which where sometimes I do feel like I'm falling or I'm failing both. Um, but it's, uh, but I wouldn't change anything. And, um, and some seasons I have time to do and some to do um, work with natural dyes and to, you know, follow my, um, my forever thirst to learn. And then sometimes I don't, and that's okay. And when we moved to Southern California, um, which I also want to um, acknowledge in where I am now is uh, unseated and, and inhabited originally by the Kumeye and Luisano people. Um, and we were in Riverside, in Riverside County for three years and moved here specifically to take care of a family home and property um, and which was going to be sold. And so we knew that. And so it was a three year period that was temporary and uh, we made the most of it. Uh, the space had 160 orange trees. It was a third generation um, orange grove. Uh, and this is picking Cosmos in uh, my dye garden, which I situated in between the first two rows of the orange grove that we had there at the house. Um, just trying to keep up with picking the flowers, which is impossible. <laughs> <clears throat> and I have I've grown dozens of different types of plants for color. And I think it's actually kind of funny that I don't, I don't really have much experience with growing edibles. <laughs> I'll get there one day, I'll get to my uh, farm gar or my kitchen garden, but um, I've really just had an obsession and, and 
um, unquenchable thirst for growing different types of plants that can give me color. But I have really figured out, particularly for where I am here in Southern California, is, you know, there's some plants that just should not be grown here because of the lack of water. And um, we did our, we've done our best to implement as, as much permaculture practices as possible. You know, we got free mulch from the city um, to cover up all of the, um, the beds to keep water usage low, drip irrigation, um, and then picking plants that I know are hardy enough. Like Cosmos, for instance, uh, I actually found out by accident, um, are incredibly hardy and very drought tolerant here. I had, I had bought a pack of uh, wildflower seed um, and just sprinkled it and set it in ground, um, more so for as an, as an ornamental. Um, and almost forgot about it and then went on a six week road trip the first summer that we lived in California and um, understood that, you know, I wasn't that I wasn't to expect much from my garden if I was going to be gone for a good deal of the growing period. And um, the water was not on our regular regular schedule and we didn't have much rainfall as you as we usually don't hear or we haven't had in decades. And uh, the cosmos did really well and they were the survivors. All the other plants were um, as you can imagine, we're not thriving, but I found that once established, that plant is just an incredibly uh, productive and giving plant. And the more you pick, the more you get for flowers. Um, other plants I really love growing include um, chamomile or coda tinctoria, which is native to the US, uh, purple pincushion flower. Um, I love purple pincushion flower for bundle dyes, particularly. It's not the best for. Um, for immersion dyeing, it's not incredibly stable because it's an anthocyanin dye, but it's really fun to grow and 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 because it's pH sensitive, um, really fun to play with my kids too to make paint. Uh, here, I you can see my first harvest of matter root, my first grown homegrown matter root that I was able to harvest. Um, it was a little frustrating having been slightly nomadic. It, you know, starting a garden in London and then leaving and then starting a garden in Brooklyn and then leaving and then starting a garden here. I finally got to harvest matter root after starting it three, three times. Um, and right before we left the Riverside home and it was a big day for me and really exciting. And I am now hoarding 10 plus pounds of dried matter root that I still haven't really done much with because life, but, um, and my kids, but I will get to it. I've done some tests and it does give really beautiful color and I'm really excited. I have lots of ideas about uh, different tests that I can do to, um, to increase the alizarin um, yield and to get as red as, as I possibly can get. And I oftentimes describe myself or my practice at least as uh, I am a tinkerer. Um, I think maybe because of the nature of being a full-time Mom, mom and, and taking care of kids is, you know, I really only have sometimes a 15 minute period <laughs> to devote to my practice um, once a day or every other day, or sometimes I'll get lucky and I'll, um, there's been periods where I have had childcare, but, but, uh, but really what I love doing is trying new things, um, changing water, changing pH, um, investigating new plants for different applications. Um, and as you know, as all of you know, as natural dyers or those that are interested in natural dyes, that it's on, it's limitless what can happen with plants and color and the interaction on cloth, um, all depending upon those variables, variables and more. Um, so this is just to explore, just to, um, to highlight that uh, things can change really. Um, and that's what's so, I think, invigorating and exciting about natural dyes. It might be frustrating for some, um, and it is sometimes frustrating too for me, but it's always different. Oh, and that's what makes it seem magical. I think you never know what you're gonna get. And um, I have been gardening with my kids. And like I said, I've learned a lot about both, you know, plants and um, idea or the forming of an identity as a person um, and how they can go hand in hand. Um, it taught me, it taught me a lot about dyes and, and not to take the elemental understanding of color from nature and, and plants themselves for granted. You know, like the simplest question, like why does this plant grow taller than that plant? 
can really, and I get them constantly. And, you know, I even have heard from Dalton, my oldest son's preschool teacher that he's, he asks more questions than she's ever had any child ask <laughs> in her whole experience career of teaching. So I've got some, I've got some good questions thrown at me constantly. And that really has forced me to dig deeper into those elemental understanding, understandings that I really didn't, you know, many things we don't, we think we know until we actually are asked those questions um, by someone who thinks we have the answer <laughs> from someone who thinks we have the answer. So um, that's been really refreshing and something that I wouldn't have expected actually <clears throat> gardening and, and parenting at the same time, particularly gardening for color. I love teaching kids too, not just my own because of those kinds of questions. Um, and uh, it really makes you do your research and, and get the, the answer and, and, and then guide them so that they can understand how, how to find the answers themselves too. Um, gardening has also taught me, gardening for color in particular, um, has also taught me a lot about, and my kids about transformation. This is the garden on the left here in the spring before the plants were in the ground. You can see the bare ground you know, between the orange trees. Um, they're in bloom here in March. And then on the right in full season with the cosmos going crazy, um, <clears throat> reseeding itself each year and just a kind of a jungle of, of flowers and plants. And transformation is for me, I think another has been another big intrigue into natural dyes, another reason why I continue to maintain to, to, to stay in this space. I mean, previous to natural dyes, I was a creative and a maker, you know, sewing, um, knitting. Uh, my dissertation and my collection that I created for my master's program was all focused on knitwear and biodiversity and animal fibers. Um, but when I landed on natural dyes, um, I feel like I stayed here in this realm as opposed to maybe jumping onto something else and, and continuing on my serial learning like I, I had been because of all of the peripheral worlds that really touch uh, botany, color science, chemistry. Um, and so there's just, you can't not, you cannot stop learning with natural dyes. And then also on that note of transformation, uh, I've continually grown indigo uh, Persicaria tinctoria, specifically Japanese indigo, uh, because of its ease of seed availability, as well as just my my understanding and 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 knowledge that it will thrive here and um, with water. Not it's not rain fed; it is irrigated. Um, although here I'm in a small now I'm in Oceanside, California, which is a, a different microclimate, and seemingly once the plants get established, watering is much much less. I've been um, grow, you know, I started seed this season in March and water them daily up until a few weeks ago where I really only have to water about once a week. Um, so once those plants get established, um, whereas here I was watering much more often because of the heat and the, um, the high heat in, in Riverside. But the top left image shows the garden after I'd harvested the indigo. So you can see the indigo growing behind that's much more lush and thick and has yet to be harvested. Um, and then you can see the extraction process here with that incredible, almost like, you know, that has to be wrong. That, that color has to be synthetic. I can't believe that's natural. That color that you get when you start the fresh leaf extraction for pigment um, when, the, when the plants have slightly fermented and uh, almost like antifreeze color, just feels so magical. And then going into pigment extraction and um, getting various shades of blue and um, asking all the questions and noting duly and um, just loving, I love summer and I love um, growing indigo because of that transformative process and how, how magical it seems and how all chemical it really, um, feels when you're in the thick of, of indigo pigment extraction. And I'm actually teaching a class in two weeks on indigo, fresh leaf indigo dyeing and indigo pigment extraction um, online. So if anybody's growing indigo and is, doesn't know what to do or feels overwhelmed with information, um, I'll be teaching a class if you're curious. This is my, this was my outdoor studio in Riverside. It's somewhat similar to what I currently have now being outside in a warm environment. Um, 
I've been like, you know, grateful that I have that and that I can work outside. Um, because being a full-time mom, uh, the, you know, little time that I do have there that I can squeeze in for, for natural dyeing, it's nice to have, to be able to go out even in the winter months and go outside at night and turn the lights on and, and extract something or strain something or, you know, with natural dyes, there's always waiting in between steps of process. So this is the studio in Riverside. This is uh, some production work. I wanted to just show a few collaborations that I've worked on uh, with different uh, designers and, um, and brands over the years. Uh, these are indigo dyed silk dresses for, for a brand called Kez New York. They're in Orange Grove. Natural dyes have definitely pushed me and challenged me as an artist more than any other medium, I feel. Um, this is five plus yards, probably six plus yards of um, indigo dyed silk dyed in my um, in my big 33 gallon vat, which, which sounds big, but anybody that's dyed in indigo knows that you gotta, you only have so much space there. Um, because of sediment in the bottom of the vat. So this was a really big challenge and it, I felt really victorious <laughs> after finishing this, this um, yardage dyeing production work. Which by the way, I don't, yardage dye work is much more challenging. And uh, most of my collaboration work uh, when I'm dyeing production for designers is done in garment stage. So, which is also really nerve wracking, but, um, for the reason of the fact that you only have so much of space and it's just me there stirring the vat. It's, I don't have any big machines. It's just me. So some more, um, some more visuals to show, uh, you know, matter root dyed silk and then um, cut and sewn into incredibly gorgeous garments by, um, this is the same brand, Kez NYC. Um, just, it's so incredible what, natural dyes can become and defy the notion that they're granola and that they can only make brown and that they're not light fast and, um, and that they can be incredibly beautiful and luscious and, um, and feel uh, and resonate <clears throat> with, with all people, not just those interested in sustainable fashion. Um, I've collaborated with a, a brand called Young Maven for a few different styles. Uh, this was a, a fun project where I eco printed with cannabis leaves. And uh, the it was really fun because it's I was printing with cannabis leaves on hemp, the cousin to cannabis. And I also kind of joke that I'm probably the only person in California growing cannabis purely for dye. <laughs> and that it is... Um, it really that is what it, that's that's where it lay that's what lies its interest for me is is its dye potential and of course it's a very um it's a medicinal plant um, recreational plant and i think the more the further that we get in an understanding of how incredible this plant is and the less stigmatized it becomes um the there is actually quite a bit of interest or sorry research online in particular i will say it is the most researched plant um, available information online of any plant that I've ever tried to research for dyes. <laughs> That's one good thing about cannabis is that there's a lot of information about, you know, the chemical components and the constituents. And so I, uh, this was a very fun, um, and fun project that sold out pretty quickly. And that was, um, that was good to hear. And I'm growing cannabis again, and perhaps we'll be able to do production in the future. And, um, but until then, I'll just be tinkering around with my cannabis leaves in my backyard. <laughs> um, I also collaborated a really uh, special collaboration for me was uh, creating a collection of rainbow silks. They're play silks for a company called Sarah Silks. And uh, they're a children's toy company and they're focused on open-ended play. And a uh, play silk is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a piece of silk that's hemmed and, and um, it's there for a child to do what they want and it's it can be a cape it can be something that you drape to to create a fort it can be you can you know put it on your body you can create a baby sling for your baby doll there's just so many different things and that's it has became evident to me when I had some play silks available for my kids to play with um and how something so simple can become 
can become so many different things. But this, uh, all of these were, all of these silks were dyed with cochineal, matter root, weld, and indigo, and botanical colors extracts were included there. And the, I, I include this collaboration too, because it was a really unique and special opportunity for me as someone who's interested in, of course, dyes, but also mordants and their effect, um, their benefits, of course, um, but their potential ill effects because of the facts that, because of the fact that they are mined metals um, that are extracted from the earth and that technically are not renewable, but also their effect on, um, on humans um, and with constant exposure. And because of this collaboration, they are toys that are to be sold to parents and then used by kids. And so they had to go through strict, rigorous uh, safety standards, which we tested all of the silks, all of the different colorways after I did the first run. And then of course, replicated my process for the production. But we found after laboratory testing, I'm just gonna read because I know that the, um, the stats are, really important, that the amount of aluminum on the silk after dyeing are at incredibly low levels. So after laboratory testing, we found that less than 780 milli milligrams per kilogram were present of alum on the cloth, um, which is at a fraction of and well beyond the new, at that time, 2019 safety standard, which was 28,000 milligrams per kilogram. So less than 780, um, which is much lower than 280, or sorry, 28,000. Um, so the, it just goes to show that alum is incredibly effective at what it does and, um, that it is safe when done, you know, when produced safely and responsibly, particularly with the, with the, with the, with the wastewater, but as a, as a thing that we are handling and that's going to be on our skin and that might even be partially ingested, you know, kids put everything in their mouths. Um, alum is, has proven, um, and because of this collaboration, um, has sort of set my mind at ease for, for at least this application with, with the play silks. Uh, another fun collaboration, or that's another Young Maven collaboration there. The, they do a lot of hemp and organic cotton blend t-shirts. Um, those are stripes painted um, with so a direct application of, of dye on more dented cloth uh, using soy milk as a, as a sizing agent, which really helps for those interested in um, cutting down on bleeding and it's an extra step, but we're all used to all those extra steps with natural dyes. So why not one extra step? And then on the right is a collaboration indigo dyed with Tennessee grown Stony Creek colors indigo on um, sweatshirts dyed for a brand called Outer Known, which is a Southern California based brand started by Kelly Slater. And it's very, very sustainable and um, one of my favorite brands, um, everything from their sourcing to their, um, to their production. I really respect Outer Known and what they're doing. And I include these images to talk, uh, to kind of prompt me to talk about always seeking ways to push, you know, to, to place natural dyes in a context of um, extending the life, the use, using life, user life of, of our garments. Um, I have, I'm always over dyeing clothing for my kids, you know, even at, we adults too, of course, we stain our clothing, we wear our clothing, we, we wear ourselves into it. And uh, it's a really, it has presented to me, life has presented to me, particularly with kids, this really um, wonderful challenge of how can I over dye that to mask that stain? And so um, these are just two examples of uh, an iron mordant application on a stained jumper belonging to my daughter on the left, and then a bundle dyed um, linen button down that I bought at a stoop sale in Brooklyn and had a couple of stains that I didn't see until I actually put it on. And so over dyed with, uh, logwood and marigold. And, um, I've over dyed since over dyed this linen shirt, probably three times, at least perhaps four times over the, it's wearing life. So, um, another example of over dyeing things to mask stains, uh, hello, garden grown cosmos flowers and marigold flowers to over dye a stained baby um, um not a swing but just like a little seat for my for my daughter um you can't see it she's also in this this the seat there so you can't really see but there was a really big stain i bought this used to begin with from someone from another mother and um 
it's now it's covered with flowers. Um, again, another example of over dyeing clothing that with children in particular, and that inevitably will become stained and dingy and over dyeing with purple pin cushion flowers uh, for my daughter May there. Um, I've, I have a, an incredible, or I have a somewhat overwhelming collection of natural dye scraps, which I've been slowly, very slowly piecing together to create, um, create something new. So another challenge that I've um, met with enthusiasm is to something to do with all of those natural dye scraps. And eventually these will be a garment, perhaps even um, something to put in the window, but I think um, I'll, I'll get a dress made eventually. And then also, I'm really curious to tap as many waste streams as I possibly can as a dyer. Um, this is a, a pigment, a lake uh, made from carrot tops. So we usually don't eat the carrot tops. We can't, uh, you, know, you can compost them of course, but why not make a dye from them and then make a lake or make a paint and, and see what you can do with, um, with all of the kitchen waste um, in your life. Another example of kitchen waste dyeing, this is a, a pigment made from avocado pits. Um, we consume avocados in our home and there are also avocado trees uh, in, in our neighborhood. Our, my neighbor across the street from our old home had uh, an avocado tree and she would just drop off her avocado pits and for me every couple of weeks and leave them in one of my garden beds. And so I've got a surplus of avocado pits and I uh, use them to make paint and of course to dye with. And I've also been really curious to eke as much potential out of the oranges. We had so many oranges uh, living in Riverside in particular with the 160 trees. And we were actually told by the city that we had to spray chemicals before they were picked at the packing, if we wanted the packing house to come and pick all the trees, which we just felt was something we couldn't do professionally uh, because it was quite a, quite a lot of oranges. And we didn't want to, and you know, we saw because we hadn't been using pesticides for the first time in, in a long time, that we saw the return of many lizards and lots of different insects that we that Sam, my partner, hadn't remembered seeing when he was a kid there. And so we didn't spray the trees. We picked all the oranges ourselves over a course of a few months, and I had so many oranges. And uh, I, after of course, uh, see learning from Michelle Garcia that oranges have a complex sugar complex sugar in the rinds um, that is called pectin that can be used as a reducing agent for an indigo bat. And so I figured, oh wow, of course I could put pen, I could maybe get an, a dye from the rinds, but what if I could use it as you know a component as to my indigo bat? And so this is orange rind extract that I, you know, I heat the orange rinds up, get the pectin rich extract, strain it in the center image there, you see the strained um, orange rind extract that then can be used to start a, 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 an indigo vat or it can be used to top up an indigo vat that's that's uh, dormant that needs to be re-reduced and then in the central image there you also see the um, the bound up rubber banded um, garment that I had dyed for that I dyed for my daughter using indigo that I grew in my garden and after I did a fresh leaf application I used that liquid topped it up with more uh, fresh indigo and then and reduced it with the orange rind extract and kind of pushed it to the, to its max. I, I don't even remember how many times I dipped that that piece into the vat to get as deep of a blue as possible. Some more examples of indigo dyed with orange rind extraction um, or dyed with orange rind extraction, extraction as a reducing agent. Um, I will, it's pretty evident if you see my social media that I have a thorough obsession with fresh leaf indigo dyeing. And I think it's the most successful way to use indigo if you're growing indigo. And it's, I have a, a tutorial on my blog. Many of you probably know how to do it. It's, it's pretty simple and, and, but also always magical and never ceases to take my breath away the, the colors that come from the fresh leaf indigo application. <clears throat> some more fresh leaf indigo. I am always trying to figure out what else I can do after the indigo, after the fresh leaf indigo 
has expired in a sense after the enzyme is, um, is no longer there. And if, of course you can uh, continue to extract for pigment, um, but seeing the color range is also really beautiful to see the, the blues to the aquas to the light greens. So what I mean by when I say push the fresh indigo, I've been doing a series of um, applications of fresh indigo on all different types of material, not just silk and wool. Fresh indigo is typically more um, successful on with an application on a protein fiber, uh, particularly wool or and, and organza and and real particularity because of the sarazen of the of the wool of, of the silk, but. Uh, I found that with repeated applications, you can get medium to almost deep blues, almost as if they had been dyed in an indigo vat with just fresh leaf. And I'll continue to do the experiments and the um, and the investigation and to see, you know, how far can I push this fresh leaf indigo application on cloth? How deep of a blue can I get? Is it light fast? You know, is it stable? And and all those questions around it. And it's just a, another avenue where I feel like there's a lot of a lot to learn. And the, and the image on the right is a wool that's dyed with nothing but fresh leaf indigo. And I did that at John Marshall's studio two summers ago, where I really kind of had a eureka moment about what could be done. And then on the left is um, everything from cotton to linen to wool to silk, all dyed with fresh leaf, only fresh leaf, with the um, massaging salt method. And then on the left, uh, another avenue of investigation into fresh leaf indigo and the colors that could come. So all of the colors that you see there all came from 200 grams of the same indigo fresh leaf. So, um, you know, everything from a simple fresh leaf extraction to salt water massage to extracting the indie rubin and in various shades, the purples and the pinks, um, and then getting um, to, to yellows, the, there's also flavonoids that are present in, in indigo, not just the indigo and then the indie rubin. But so this plant really has so much to give and it's been fun tinkering and figuring that out. And then this summer we started, we kind of kicked off the natural dye season, a natural garden, natural dye garden season with my daughter by doing a fresh leaf indigo application on her hair, which was really fun. And she still has blue hair. It's been a couple weeks now. Um, and it's, really stable and I'm really surprised. I thought it would wash out immediately, but it's it's not as dark as it was when, when we originally did it, but it is still blue. We've also that dyed hair, but to do the fresh leaf, it's just so simple and easy. It's just to rub the indigo into your hair and get a stable blue dye. I will say too that I have had bleached hair in the past and I have dipped my bleached hair in indigo vat. And when I got my hair cut from a stylist, she remarked on the color and said, oh, wow, like, you know, that's how, when did you do that? And I said, oh, at least a month ago or maybe six weeks. And she was like, that's incredible that that's still that blue. And that's better than a lot of the synthetic dyes that I've seen on, on hair. So those looking for blue dye might consider indigo as an alternative to synthetic dyes. Um, and I will, I, I show these slides, or at least these applications of natural dyes just to sort of highlight my how my practice has pivoted from production dyeing and a dream of starting a natural dye house <laughs> to working with my kids and and figuring out ways to to satiate my love for natural dyes alongside them you know dyeing stale rice from the pantry <laughs> with old natural dye that's been kicking around in the fridge for months um and uh, that's a flower press there that I've painted with um, watercolors that I made for my kids for the for Christmas. Um, and then this new avenue of creating paints from plant color and creating lake pigments and then making watercolors is also just another I feel endless avenue that I am really excited to continue to run down. Um, the green color you see on the top left of the screen is cannabis and indigo, both homegrown, and then that orangey brown on the bottom is Coreopsis. And then you can see all the all of the colors labeled there, the paint, the paints that I have been making. And I'm testing them now and, and seeing about light fastness and all the different things that you can consider with when you're making paints. And also, you know, we've dyed beads together. I initially started dyeing beads because my partner and I were going on a um, cross-country 
train or um, plane ride with our young children and trying to figure out ways to keep them occupied during the, the plane ride. And he had the right idea to get a bead kit. And so he got the kit and he said, you should dye them. And so we dyed them together. And this image here on the right shows the wood beads on a uh, bracelets that I've been wearing consistently on my right hand for almost two years. And then on my left hand dyes beads that were dyed freshly that had not been worn. So you can see, of course, they change and mature over time, but I think in, in a really beautiful way. And so thank you for listening to my story of, uh, of my journey in natural dyes. And I love teaching. This year has been really hard. I know for so many people and I'm just really grateful to be able to connect with with people um, even without physically being with people and I can't wait to get back to teaching in person but for the time being I'm teaching online workshops and hope to see um, everybody in the internet world <laughs> as well as in person again someday thanks Liz <laughs> let's see can you stop the share? Like stop mm -hmm, your mm -hmm. share screen. Thanks so much for that. I, I feel like just, just um, hold on. I'm gonna make it so I can see all of you guys. There you are. Yeah, I, I feel like just going through that presentation was like what it's like to just look at you on Instagram every day and just trying to like as we're all trying to do things like what's Liz doing now? There are beads. There's paint. There's, and she again has three children, but. Uh, you know, Liz, I don't know, I guess I'm gonna ask you one question because we're only, we're, usually we stop at, at one, but, and there's there's not tons of questions, but I, so I'm wondering if maybe you can answer them, I can send them to you and then you could answer and then we can put it in a, in the blog post. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, definitely, yeah, okay. that's great. Sorry for running so far over. No, I think this has been a little wacky morning with, uh, <laughs> with everything that's gone on. So, but that was a, a great presentation, super inspirational. And some of the some of the people who have been putting, you know, nice words about you in the chat are calling you their their inspiration. So, so this is all good stuff. But somebody did ask if you were going to ever write a book. Like, when <laughs> is that going to happen? I, I have, a, yeah, I would love to write a book. I feel like I want to figure out what exactly it is I want to say first, and I want it to be something that people find intriguing and tells my story. I had an opportunity to write a book this year and I, I declined it because we moved this year and it's been insane for lots of different reasons, but, um, but yeah, I would love to. And any ideas, if anybody has any ideas of the type of book that they would like to see from me, let me know. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, and, uh, Breeze Honeycutt, I, did you, I was, I was wondering if you put, uh, Breeze and Breeze's Liz, Liz Spencer, Dogwood Dyers, Instagram and website. And okay, I didn't double check. I can check, do it but... again now. All right. Yeah. So check out Liz. If you don't follow her, you'll be, you know, sitting around going, oh my God, what am I not doing? <laughs> <laughs> You're all, I, I love everything you do, Liz. It's, um, border, it's borderline uh, compulsive. I mean, what is not for it's compulsive. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I think that's how a lot of people work. It's like, you know, some people, some dyers that I've talked with, they're like, you know, they want to just stay, I just want to want to do this. But I especially have loved watching your fresh leaf indigo dying and all the work that you've done there. Yeah, it's just been great. Yeah, I want to put right. it on that night. Life's short. <laughs> yeah, <Love> yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, again, yeah, thank you. And and everybody follow Liz at the Dogwood Dyer on Instagram. It seems like you're not very, you're not really on Facebook, but. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. There, personally. But I, yeah, people. I'm there personally. I don't, I tr it's all linked and, and it, it automates in, but I go on, I get overwhelmed. You know, there's enough for us to be overwhelmed by with yeah. digital devices that I go on Facebook and I'll, you know, uh, say hi to my parents and then. <laughs> and then see all the notifications and then, ah, and then delete. All right. So just, just go check out our website then and go on Instagram and forget Facebook. <laughs> but thanks so much, Liz, for, for dealing with getting three kids to be taken care of so they didn't come interrupt you and for 
dealing with the car accident and getting here still on time. See? Thank you. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you all this call's recorded. <laughs> Kathy's going to kill me. Um, and by the way, Kathy is seeing her mom for the first time in a year. That's where Kathy is today. So, so that's why she's, she's on an, on an airplane right now. So I just have a couple reminders, um, a couple things. So we have, what, do, what are you yeah. saying there, Brees? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have a bunch of books that are on sale right now. We put it in the newsletter yesterday but we have about nine natural dye and textile books that are on sale if, if you guys are interested just till the end of the month and they are flying out the door. I can't even believe how many books are selling. We also have a couple of uh, Abu Bakar's classes where we have a couple more spaces open for the mud classes with Abu Bakar if you're interested. And also I like how I put myself like I should be talking about myself in the third person here. But we are having an event in Seattle, August 21st, I think it is. And we've been taking email. I've been getting emails from you guys. Thank you so much to be vendors at a pop up we're going to have. So we have a whole bunch of people. That, so if you use our, our dyes and you make products out of them and you want to be at our very first post pandemic or sort of post pandemic event, email me sustainability at botanical colors and i will put you on our list and then at the end of the month we'll we'll get in touch with everybody it seems like we're going to need a bigger space go figure and we'll also be doing a community indigo dip that weekend and we will be having a skill building class that wednesday and thursday so kind of building on the things that you already know but stuff you know with shibori how do you get green how do you use iron so we'll have more information about that. So, and next week, we'll be talking with Kim Eichler Mesmer. And Kim is a quilt artist who has been hand dyeing fabric for nearly 20 years. In 2015, she made the decision to switch from using synthetic dyes to natural dyes and began a journey of learning and discovery guided by experts in the field, such as Catherine Ellis and Michelle Garcia. Kim will share her work, how the learning process influences her, and discuss how her work has evolved since making the switch to natural dyes, which should be pretty amazing. You can follow Kim Eichler Mesmer now and just kind of see what she's doing on Instagram. And now, and now, Brees, are you ready? Picture of the week. Week, 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 week. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Adriana, where are you? I'm right here. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to spotlight you and get it off of me. <laughs> all right, let me spotlight you. And then I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to show this cool image. So this is Adriana Moreno from Moonshadow Goods. And I loved seeing the, this picture this week about all those natural dye swatches that you were over dyeing with indigo and just maybe talk a little bit more about why you were why you were doing that. Yeah, well, um, first of all, good morning. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Amy, for reaching out for this. Um, this is great. I had no idea. Um, so um, I have been uh, experiment with indigo, just like all of you um, guys. And um, this was kind of more of an exploration into the iron vat. I haven't um experimented with it yet i think my go-to is just you know the fructose and the hen of that those are the ones that i'm more familiar with and i just love the results of them um but i re recently uh was looking at heidi who has this really great tutorial i think she goes by honey folk um she's here too yeah hi <laughs> on instagram and um she she has this really great tutorial that just makes it seem really simple. Um, I don't really know what my hesitation was for not trying the iron. I think it's just maybe I didn't have all of the ingredients, but um, I watched her her tutorial and I'm like, okay, I have all the things. I think I can like let's just get into it, you know. And um, so her recipe was a little bit. Um, I actually. Uh, 
uh, broke the recipe in half just because, you know, it was my first time experimenting with it. I didn't want to waste that precious indigo. Um, so I did a, tw I did a 25 grams of indigo. I think her tutorial is um, 50. So I, you know, something that I'm a little bit more comfortable is like less wasting a little bit less of that indigo. Um, so yeah, I, I tried it. Um, the first, uh, I actually let it set for 24 hours, um, which is, you know, something that you actually do for the fructose that and the henna that that's just, that's just what it is. Um, and my, the first dips were the blue, of course, which if you, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that there's a picture of all the blues that I did. And then I, you know, I always have a bunch of other um, swatches for my other natural dye experiments. So I thought, okay, let's just see if I can um, get a range of color, you know. Um, and you can also do this with fresh leaf indigo. I did that last year. Um, I'm also growing my own little indigo patch. Um, so you can also do that with the fresh leaf indigo with the um, salt rub method as well. And you can, it's it's amazing because like the colors that you get from fresh leaf is so different from the iron bath. So um, you can really extend that range um, by over dyeing the swatches that you already have. Um, so that that was really fun experiment. And you know, I'm, I'm always trying to push to see what other colors I can get, you know? Um, so, and I love the layering, just all the different layers of color. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what this picture was. It's just kind of like, okay, what else can I put in this vat? Yeah. Um, and this, this actually was from, I let the vat sit for maybe like three to four days, which like even made the indigo color just a little bit darker. Um, so that always says that to just make your, make your dive at and let it sit for a couple of days or she's coming to the East coast and she's asked me to make up the dive vats for a class. Mm -hmm. She definitely wants them like three made three days ahead to just season. But Liz, have you ever used, um, fresh leaf indigo to do this? Oh, hold on. I'm muted. Um, fresh leaf indigo then to, to reduce with iron. Have you ever done, like you had a just, I know I've seen your swatch book. It's pretty amazing, but have you ever taken those, those swatches and, and over dye them with fresh leaf indigo? Oh yeah. Um, I haven't done much over dyeing with, with fresh leaf indigo, like some yellows, but I've seen what Adriana has done with, with her over dyeing and, um, and noted it as something that I want to do in the future. <laughs> and I all, I'm really glad that you're here, Adriana. And I also wanted to note too, that you're, a big inspiration to me and also someone who's um who's inspired me in a big way particularly with the cannabis plants yeah i'm not yeah. sure that i'm not sure i believe that you're just growing cannabis plants for natural dying side note <laughs> why was she late to the meeting <laughs> yeah why was she late to the meeting she's just doing a little bit of uh some harvesting or something so it's been a really hard year <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks adriana and it's i'm sorry you, you know what it's at moonshadow goods sorry at moonshadow goods yes. so follow adriana she's if she's an inspiration to liz she's an inspiration to botanical colors you should probably follow adriana and Heidi is here too i just want to also tell you guys that we always hang out for like an hour after this so if i know liz has to take off to to go tend to her kids. But, you know, if there are questions that you want to ask each other, I know Heidi's here. I don't know, or maybe Heidi has taken off. I can't see her anymore. But if you want to ask Heidi any questions or, and Adriana, you're welcome to stay too. But anyways, just want to let you guys know that we always share what, what everybody's doing, kind of projects and stuff, and just talk and open the chat up. So so that's that's it for feedback friday this week without kathy hattori i hope it went okay i had to put on extra deodorant today myself but um yeah if you want to unmute yourselves and say hi and bye or say something to liz or adriana go for it thank, thank you, you. you guys are thank both you. super awesome awesome thank you, liz. yay I enjoyed, I enjoyed your story <laughs> It was wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely thank to you. see you. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. When my uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was wonderful. Thank you, Madeline. Hey. Bye. 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 Yeah. And I'm happy to answer questions. I saw some really good ones. Yeah, okay. I know. You want to, I mean. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say um, the minimum amount of indigo plants that are needed in order to play. Someone asked that. Um, mm -hmm. One, you know, you don't have to have a whole garden full of indigo plants. That's what's so <laughs> incredible about the fresh leaf process is that one plant will suffice to just do a little bit of play. And particularly if you're gonna, not for pigment extraction, but for doing fresh leaf, all, all you need is one. And um, and you don't need uh, space in the ground. You can grow, um, can everyone hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. you. You can grow in pots. I grow, I've grown in pots for the past two years. I just recently moved and now I have a ground space, but but previous to that, I was growing in pots. So, and I had really healthy indigo. So just get really good soil <clears throat> and you'll, you'll be great. Oh, what do you more than I have a question. Okay, Suzanne, go um, for it. You know, this is a, I don't know what um, salt water massage is uh, <laughs> for plants. I mean, you know, personally that's a different issue but I, I don't know about that in fresh leaf indigo dying. Um, sure. Which, yeah, I can answer. Um, the salt is not mandatory. Uh, and so what can be done is to use it as an aid. It will help draw the moisture. And also as a result, the endoxyl, which is the precursor to indigo, um, which will then, or sorry, the ind indican, which will then hydro or not hydrolyze, but um, oxidize into endoxyl and then indigodin. Uh, but the salt will help pull pull that out of the leaves more efficiently and you use you can use so you can get away with using much less water so you take your indigo leaves work with them as quickly as you possibly can um and ideally a cool environment to keep that um the enzyme and the endoxyl stable before they oxidize to indigo um working quickly and massage the indigo leaves with your material that you want to dye um, with salt as well, if you choose, and um, you don't even necessarily have to add water. You're working with the natural um, hydration of the leaves and then getting as concentrated as, as possible indigo indican application onto the cloth. And this is not something I, this is something I learned from an, an indigo friend, Britt Bowles of Sea Spell Fiber, who posted it on a really great indigo growing Facebook group called Indigo Pigment Extraction Facebook group. Um, she um, brought it to the attention of the group after seeing um, a Japanese master dyer who grows indigo. Um, I forget the name of the dyer um, in the dye house in Japan that had posted a YouTube video using salt <laughs> to do a drip direct application, whereas previously um, the kind of common indigo fresh leaf knowledge was to use a blender technique, you know, putting the leaves in a blender with some cold water, blending it up, straining it, and then that liquid will be your dye bath to put the, the protein fibers into. Um, or if you're going to use cellulose fibers, I recommend trying a soy milk pretreatment if you want to make the cellulose fibers more like a protein fiber. Um, that's, but the salt leaf mess, salt massage method is really fun. It takes a little bit more time. Um, you're, you're really there for, you know, 10 to 15 minutes working the leaves into the cloth and, um, seeing that slow, um, change transformation of a, of a green leaf to a blue dye on cloth. And it's the most direct and usually you'll get the most concentrated of color. And I think there's something too about the physical manipulation and, and, and um, application and, and literally massaging the, the indigo din that, that oxidizes in tandem um, with the environmental oxid, with the, um, sorry, with the, with oxygen in, in um, the atmosphere onto the cloth and pushing it into the fiber. I think there's something something there um, that's really important if you want a deep, dark, as much of a deep concentration of color as possible, as opposed to immersing the fiber in a liquid that's been, um, that has the endoxyl extracted in it. I when, hope that when, you, <laughs> uh, when you When you said, you know, 10 minutes of massaging, are you, I mean, what size of a, piece of fabric are you doing? Um, 
I'm yeah. just curious because you want to, you know, I'd want to do something that I could make something else out of, of course. <laughs> yeah, you definitely can. You just need more leaves and you might even want a partner to help you. you <laughs> a big piece of like a yard of silk, for instance, it's definitely mm -hmm. possible. You just would, you, you would want to use um, probably something like 200% of the weight of the fiber at minimum uh, weight of fresh leaves um, mm -hmm. in order to get you know, a perceivable blue color. And then you could use more if you like, if you want more color. And then, you know, those, that image that I showed of the, uh, the medium blue freshly fendigo dyed textiles, those had been applied, the, the freshly fendigo had been applied seven to eight times at that point. So I started with a light blue and then dyed the textiles, waited a couple days, harvested some more indigo, did it again, and then again and again. So that was a progression over a, se of a su over a summer of multiple applications of fresh of indigo to get to that medium blue color. It looks dark blue when it's wet, but when it dries, it's a medium blue. And I'm hoping this summer I'll have time to do more and see if I can get to de a deeper dark blue. Thanks, that was great. Hey, Liz, uh, Helen, is, Helen wanted to know if you've ever used grapefruit instead of oranges. I haven't, but I'm sure um, that there's pectin there. I haven't, I've been curious about lemons. I don't know about the pectin content of lemon rinds uh, because our neighbor has a lemon tree and we got gifted a whole box of lemons and who needs a whole box of lemons? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but grapefruit, uh, definitely, I'm sure there's some pectin Liz, there. Liz, I couldn't get it to work. Oh. We had I a grapefruit tree and it makes great it makes great marmalade, but I cannot get, I could not get it to work in Tucson where it was warm. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there's, if you can make marmalade, then, then there's definitely pectin. I've, yeah, I've also been curious, I'm hoping this summer to do some tests between um, like a fermented rind, vat, rind bath and a fresh rind extraction. I have some rind extraction that is really old that I forgot about sitting in a bucket that mysteriously also hasn't molded. <clears throat> but so it's fermented and it's grown much darker in color. And I wanted to see too about using, you know, same volume of liquid and trying to reduce two vats of the, of the same strength of indigo and seeing if there's any differences there. Also, of course, testing pH and, and seeing, but I think maybe try and extract the orange rinds or the grapefruit rinds even more or uh, use less indigo because you have to use quite a bit of orange rind extraction um, to get enough pectin to act as an antioxidant as a reducing agent. So maybe that right. would... um, Did you scrape, you know, all the white goo that's on the inside of rind? Did you scrape all that off? Or did no, you leave I, it? Yeah, I just leave it. I just, you know, we eat the fruit and then, um, and then I just cover it, the rinds with water, hot water extraction for about an hour, um, strain. And then if you want to be super efficient, you could do another extraction, you know, put fresh water on those rinds and mm -hmm. try and get even more pectin out. If you can, with another hour long hot water extraction, add that liquid to your original, and then use that to start your indigo vat or add it to your current sleepy indigo vat. Right. I'm thinking that maybe the, um, fermenting it might be interesting to ferment it first. Mm -hmm. I'll try it next year when we have when I have grapefruit by the bushel again. <laughs> Liz, the classes that you have right now, what are the, what are the classes are, and are they online? Just yeah, sure. I have coming up. I finished my I suppose a five series workshop series. The first one was on mordants and preparation for fabric, and that was last week. Um, it is recorded, and so you can have, if you're a participant, you get access to the recording as well. So and a lot of people get a little anxious about taking notes yes. during a live workshop, but the great thing is that they're recorded. So you have access as a participant. I'm working on now, if anybody wants to retroactively take the Mordant class, you can email me or contact me and I can, um, we can work out a way to, to do that since it's already happened. But yeah, they are in, per, you know, not in person, but live workshops with Zoom facilitating just like this um, in my, backyard studio and then the next class coming up is the special seasonal class it's the fresh leaf indigo and then also pigment extraction so first part of class is fresh leaf indigo second part is pigment extraction from indigo right. and then the next class is extracting dyes and dyeing fabric and then the class after that is indigo vat proper indigo vat 
And then the final class is eco printing and leaf printing and flower mm -hmm. printing. And Brees put the upcoming workshops link in the chat right now. It's in there right now. Thank you. Um, Liz, do you want to answer a couple more questions? Yeah, if you're if anyone someone who's having trouble getting the indigo seeds to grow, the seed might be old. For Sicaria in particular, the, if the seed's more than a, a season zero, you know, if it's 2019 seed, you want to sow that to spring 2020. Um, so that is oftentimes um, the reason why germination rates are low. If the seed's old, you can freeze the seed that's supposed to help uh, maintain its vitality. Um, but even if it's old, give it a try. You'll just get lower germination rate. Soak the seeds before you sow. That really helps with germination, just an overnight soak. Um, those are good. That's what I would suggest. Um, my I'm cannabis. Go back. Oh yeah, did you Sorry. want to call out any questions that you think I should answer? Well, Wendy, who's here, asked: Is is there? Uh, do you have any experience with dried indigo leaves? Oh yes, that's. I saw that question. Uh, I don't. I have a lot. I'm hoarding, you know, pounds of it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I just, I just haven't gotten to it, and I, I'm gonna try John Marshall. John Marshall's method. I don't want to use Thiox. I'm going to try Michelle Garcia's method that he's shared in his Facebook group using, okay. I think, sodium. It's not sodium acetate. Using something that basically partially digests the cellulose. So what happens when you have dried indigo leaves yes. is the indigodin dies the cellulose. It dies the actual leaf. That's why it's blue. It's oxidized. Yeah. And you can see oh, the indigodin. Yeah. Um, so you've got to extrapolate that from the cellulose. And from my understanding of the, you know, Google Translate French re recipe that he shared on his Facebook page, the, um, he, he creates a, he extracts the, the flavonoids first, the yellow from the um, dried indigo leaves, just as John Marshall has suggested in his book, The Singing the Blues. But also, um, there's another chemical component that he adds that partially um, <clears throat> digests the cellulose. It's commonly used in rayon manufacture that helps break that bond between the indigo and the cellulose of the leaf. And then it's much more available to use, to reduce, and then use as a dye. So I'm going to try that. And maybe I can find that link to that web to his Facebook page where he have shared it. Ever, have you ever tried the uh, the fermenting bowl balls like to do with woad? <laughs> like how I've heard about that system too. The Japanese uh, dyers use this system, right? Yeah, I've never tried fermenting. Um, sorry, composting. Um, I have done a fermentation vat, not with my own. Yeah. grown indigo i've started with botanical colors pigment and then fermented it using we ran and you know cheryl cheryl yeah. colander's uh, recipe from um from her website but uh i've never tried couching or oh, right. um composting yeah. and i just don't have enough and i know it's possible i know people do it like in styrofoam coolers um and but one day I'll try it. <laughs> As you said, I have a question. Never finished. <laughs> Can I ask you a quick question? How sure. far apart do you plant your indigo seeds? I've started a bunch of seeds and I heard they don't like to be moved a lot. So I have a lot in one little container. So I don't know if I should pl just plant the container. And, I mean, they're just starts. Or if yeah. I should somehow only plant a couple of them and then pull the rest out and say goodbye. Yeah, don't you don't necessarily have to thin them. From my experience, um, from you know just learning over doing it in many seasons, they really actually appreciate being crowded when the seeds come yeah. up. If you sow the seeds kind of densely, yeah. um, more so than you would any other plant or uh, many other seeds. Um, they'll come up, and you can sow. And what I'll do is they'll come up after they're about an inch or two high. Um, they're actually pretty hardy. I'll pull them out of the seventy-two cell. Um, starts that I have, divide them into four or three, depending upon how crowded they are, and then up pot them. Uh, and then, you know, give them a little bit more soil and then they grow a little bit more, maybe like when they get to six leaves or um, then they could even be divided even further and then put into the ground or transplanted to their permanent spot wherever you're growing them. But they actually really like su the support of each other. Um, uh, they, at, from my 
experience seeing the way that they thrive being crowded when they're small. Well, thank um, you. Thank yeah. you. And then also, if you're curious, Roland Ricketts' website, which he's had for 10 plus years, his whole process of where the way that he's learned and taught, been taught in Japan, um, sh shows that where he just broadcasts or he's got thick, thickly sown seed in a massive container in a greenhouse. It all comes up like a carpet of indigo seedlings, and then it's all divided and then transplanted into the field. So his yeah. website is really what beautiful visual uh, explanation of it. We had, a, we had him on feedback. Friday a while back. So if you guys, I, I'll dig it out in a sec, the Feedback Friday where Roland talked, but it was a really good presentation. We got to it see was. his studio and talked about his practice and had some fun with him too. Let's see. Sure. Um, you know, some, I think Melanie might've asked this question kind of twice, but it using about like, what's the, so is it better to use cannabis sativa or indica leaves to print with, or does it make a difference? I don't know yet. I. I would suspect every leaf is going to be different. I've been told when my first experiment with cannabis was not my own homegrown. It was a friend who gifted me the leaves. She was harvesting the flower and the leaves were just going to go in the compost. So I used her leaves that she so graciously cut and then saved for me. And then I used them, but to eco print with, and many of the leaves had purple coloration to the stem, purple color, a slight purple coloration to the base of the leaves. And I got some incredible color transfer because of that. Um, so all variety, I would assume cannabis, uh, sativa, indica, I'm growing <laughs> uh, seed saved and shared with me from a friend. It's not feminized, so it's not for growing for flower. Um, and it's banana kush. And I've also been told, and I've been, I was hoping to seek out some seed for, of a purple stem variety um, and was told that you can actually stress the plant when it's young um, to, you know, coax it into creating more purple coloration on the leaves. I also have a ton of frozen pressed leaves that I'm hoping to experiment to with that I just couldn't get to last season because it was just too much. But yeah, I think that if they could be um, studied and, and for, for chemical dye compound too, that would be incredible to see the variety of, of color, chemical colorants that are found in cannabis leaves. Um, I know they're sm much smaller than in a lot of, uh, you know, historical dye plants like Weld, for instance. Um, but there is l luteolin, I know, which is the, the, the yellow colorant for Weld in cannabis leaves. So that's promising for, for fastness at least. It's, it's not, I'd say it's about medium fastness um, for as a, as a yellow dye. But if you iron modify, which I've done when I ego print, um, it's much more stable on textiles. I just had to shut the shades here because the, I'm looking at mountains with the sun glaring at me. And I just realized that my eyes were about to peel out like orange peels. <laughs> <laughs> How's that bird doing, Amy? That's side note. What's that? How's that bird doing? I'm still looking to identify it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever, um, if there are any birding people here, but when you look at bird books and it tells you what the bird calls sound like, it's just, that's pretty funny. Like <laughs> Jenny goes, Jenny goes, sweet, sweet, sweet. Or, you know, like, what, what does that mean? Anyways, there's some type of, I'm in Bethel, Maine. So there's some type of melodic, ethereal beautiful bird here that is just it's just like the sound is sort of is in the mountains suddenly whenever i hear it and then we have the whippoorwills that that i've been hearing at night that have been so beautiful but mm. yeah on cornell's website you can listen to all their bird calls they've got like a place where you can go and listen to everyone if you're oh, checking huh? yeah it's really good cornell <laughs> cornell ornithology oh okay I will, I mean, I'm taking off out of here tomorrow and I will find out what that bird is. It's funny, like, it's funny when ask you know, him, yell out the window. Who are you? What's up? I was making a joke. Don't worry oh. about it. <laughs> it was a really silly joke. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, this is what, it's joking time. So, uh, Amy, we're still recording. Do you want me to? Want to say something profound, Liz, to end this so people oh. can see? <laughs> oh um the kids are hungry 
<laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I'm of the school of thought with natural dyes and I feel like I will be, maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know, but, but, you know, people ask me like, what should I grow or what's a good dye plant? And every plant is a dye plant and it's all depends on what color you want. And, you know, there's no wrong way to do this. And with every dyer, there's a different way. There's a different um, method and your practice is yours. Um, I love embracing the ephemeral colors, the ones that are fugitive. It's an opportunity to over dye, but I also really respect the historical dye stuffs that, that are tried and true. And, you know, if you're going to go through all the trouble of growing your own dyes, you want it to last as long as you can. So, but you can't mess it up. It's <laughs> yay. Just, yeah, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and then you'll probably, um, you'll learn a lot more probably through doing than than reading or doing it someone else's way. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Very generous. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bri. Thank you. Liz. you. Bye. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Brisa, did you want to stop?